Good morning and welcome to the Japan Society's regular webinar on current affairs and business. I am Bill Lemmert and I have the honor and pleasure of chairing the Japan Society. Tonight in Nashville, Tennessee, Joe Biden and Donald Trump will hold their second and last televised debate ahead of America's election day on November the 3rd in just 12 days time. It is reported that more than 40 million Americans have already cast their votes for their chosen president, for senators and congressmen, for governors and state legislators, for judges, and at least in popular myth, rat catchers. That represents something in excess of one quarter of the 140 to 150 million people who are likely to vote. But what is at stake both for Americans and for the rest of us, notably America's close allies in Britain and Japan? That is the topic of today's discussion. We know, of course, what is at stake in the personalities of the two presidential candidates. But what are the underlying forces at play in the country that used to take pride in calling itself the leader of the free world? And what should Britons and Japanese, as outsiders, think about them? We know, yes, that one of those forces is President Trump himself. One of our speakers today, Professor David Runciman, has written that, quote, democracies can accommodate quite a lot of irrationalism. What is not clear is whether they can accommodate it when it emanates from the center, to which one could now add, nor when some of what emanates from that center amounts to a quite rational effort to avoid constraint by the rule of law and to win re-election by any means possible. But we also know that there are other longer term issues those who feel content that America's two century old constitution has been doing its job of providing checks and balances against demagogues tend to ignore the fact that one element of those checks, the Senate, has become grossly unrepresentative with unpopulated rural states and tiny ones, each blessed with two senators, the same as California with 40 million people. This bias has happened to protect President Trump from impeachment and from serious checks on his, his actions but in future, that sort of bias may protect others or affect others too. Moreover, we know that many congressional seats are hopelessly gerrymandered and that efforts at blocking categories of people from voting are rife in many states. And probably next week, the Senate will break precedent by confirming a new Supreme Court justice just before the election, potentially establishing a clear bias in the other great checker and balancer of the system. Moreover, all this is against the background of a society that is highly polarized, both by wealth inequality and on some cultural issues. Part of that polarization is expressed indeed in stories about militias, about fears of actual post-election violence, and very recently in the foiled plot to kidnap the governor of Michigan, Gretchen Whitmer. We know all this, but our question today is how much does it matter? Democracy has always stumbled from crisis to crisis, from inequity and stormy dispute into calmer waters. My bookshelves are filling up with works with titles such as The Twilight of Democracy, or indeed Professor Runciman's own book from two years ago, How Democracy Ends. So we must ask, how serious is the danger today in the United States and what difference would the result on November the 3rd make? To address these questions, I give a warm welcome to two very distinguished and indeed concerned speakers. In Tokyo, I welcome Hitoshi Tanaka, who had a long and remarkable diplomatic career, culminating in roles as chief negotiator with North Korea and as vice minister for foreign affairs. Hitoshi is now chairman of the Institute for International Strategy at the Japan Research Institute and is a frequent commentator in the Japanese media. And in Cambridge, I welcome David Runciman, whose work I've already partially introduced. David is professor of politics at Cambridge University, a frequent contributor to the London Review of Books, host of the Talking Politics podcast, and has published a number of important books on democracy, including both the one I already mentioned and back in 2013, the book called The Confidence Trap. Each of our speakers will open with 10 minutes of remarks, following which we will have a discussion and, most important of all, as always, your questions. As usual, please submit questions using the Q&A function and do vote for other people's questions if you'd like me to elevate them. This week, I'm going to start in Britain with David Runciman. Over to you, David. 
Great, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. So um, I just want to say a few things that pick up on some of the points that Bill just made. But the first thing is, it is clearly the case that this is a very important election. Um, but in my lifetime, every American presidential election is always described as the most important election ever. And the future of the Republic every four years seems to hang in the balance. And we need to remember that that's almost never true. Most elections are oversold as historical events and that the big changes in American politics tend not to map onto the presidential electoral cycle timescale. Uh, it's not always the case. Some elections really do matter, but most don't. And I think we should remember that, that though 2020 is likely to be looked back on as a very important year because of the pandemic, a, a hinge year, a pivot year in the 21st century, it's unlikely, it's possible, but it's unlikely it'll be because of this election. It might be, but that, that is not the default. But at the same time, there seems to be an assumption, another piece of conventional wisdom, that this is both the most important ele election in the history of the Republic, and that Joe Biden is a weak candidate and a kind of placeholder candidate, and that what matters for many people is, does Trump win or lose? It doesn't matter so much who defeats him. And I don't think those things can both be true. Um, people who passionately wish Trump to lose, but also believe that Biden is a bridge to somewhere else and his presidency will just be four years of treading water while we all get our breath back. Um, that seems to me an implausible account of how significant political change happens, but also actually because not all elections are damp squibs. Some of them really do matter. I think it's also worth remembering, if you look at this historically, that most elections look very different in hindsight than they do in anticipation. And the ones that really did make a huge difference and the candidates who we can see were transformative were often the ones of whom there were the least expectations. So just to take three, you don't have to agree with me that this is the top three. I'm not sure it is the top three, but Abraham Lincoln, Franklin Roosevelt, Ronald Reagan, three transformative presidents. Each of them in the campaign when they first won the White House was widely derided as um, a stopgap, a placeholder, in Lincoln's case, a failed lawyer, Roosevelt, a political hack, Reagan, a failed B-movie actor, as people always used to say, which made one wonder, well, would it have been better if he was an A-movie actor? Um, it was grossly unfair in each case, because what they were were seasoned political operators, each of them. But um, there were very low expectations around each of those three. Um, and it's only with hindsight that we know they were the transformative candidates. So it's not clear to me that we should necessarily write Biden off because what else, what, one thing you can say about him is that um, he is also a seasoned political operator. Uh, the transformative candidates in anticipation are rarely the transformative candidates in hindsight. And the contrast I would draw is with Barack Obama, who I think was in many ways a very good president. Um, but the kind of expectation of transformation around his candidacy and then his victory. I think with hindsight, whatever else you want to say about the Obama years, they were not transformative. Um, and that may have something to do with the fact that he had many, many qualities, but he was not a seasoned political operator, unlike his vice president, who is. Um, Obama has many qualities, I think, that Biden lacks, but Biden does not lack inside knowledge of how Washington works. And so I think it's possible, I mean, this is just a roundabout way of saying, I think we should be wary with presidential elections of thinking that it'll look the same in the mirror as it does through the windscreen as we look ahead. And this could well be one of those. Um, I don't know, I mean, who knows? We, Bill asked us not to make predictions, so I won't. Um, but then to pick up on the broader themes, um, I think it's also true that whoever wins faces enormous challenges because of the constraints now on transformative change in American politics, or even actually on any significant lasting change. And I, I was gonna highlight three very briefly we could pick up on and they touch on what we heard in the introduction, uh, just, but just to put them slightly differently. So I think it is true that um, you know, America suffers various forms of institutional and constitutional paralysis and inertia. Um, the constitution is old and it hasn't changed for a long time. But I think the thing that we need to remember about it is not only is it old and may well not be fit for purpose, to use a horrible cliche, but it's incredibly hard to change it. I mean, it's not simply that um, the Constitution and its checks and balances constrain people in power, 
but people in power have very, very few options to change the rules of the game because it was set up not only to constrain demagogues, but to be relatively hard to reform. And if reform is needed, it's not at all clear that any president, and, and this could include presidents who control the Senate, who control the House of Representatives, potentially even, and this is not how it's meant to work, control the Supreme Court. The, the hardest thing of all to do in American democracy is to change the rules of the game. And so if the rules of the game aren't working, there's a real problem. And I think we see this now, so the debate around the Supreme Court, there are two ways of thinking about how you might change Supreme Court politics, one of which is to seek a consensus, some sort of political consensus or coalition to introduce institutional reform. <clears throat> and the other is to pack the court with your people because the other side have packed the court with their people in a kind of zero sum tit for tat version of politics. Well, almost everyone assumes that the only option is the second, not the first. Um, and the thing about the second tit for tat, zero sum judicial politics is that it probably makes changing, getting consensus to change the institutional setup harder, not easier, because it's, it, it escalates. I mean, it's really hard to see how court packing um, produces anything other than further resistance on the other side and a deepening entrenching of the institutional constraints. So there's a huge challenge there. Second one, very briefly, in an age of polarization, and I think we all agree this is a partisan polarized society, one of the fault lines that opens up in American politics is between the federal government and the states. And that fault line is clear for all to see. Um, and it's acute. It's been acute during the Trump presidency. And I suspect it would be just as acute during a Biden presidency. One of the ways in which partisanship manifests itself is if someone controls the center, those parts of America where there is real power and authority to act differently use that power. And that raises a real question, I think, for outsiders looking in. So one way to think about this, I'm not qualified to comment on Japanese responses to this, but um, I mean, a, a real question, I think it would be a question for anyone, but maybe particularly in somewhere like Japan, is the central relationship here with California on some questions or is it with Washington? That's a real question for, I think, anyone looking at American politics from the outside. And California is an enormously powerful, site of power. It's the site of, as we know, wealth. That's where Silicon Valley is. It's at the front line of climate change, of immigration issues. Um, and there is a view among international relations scholars that the 21st century is going to see much greater significance for relationships between political actors whose legitimacy and authority comes from city government or regional government than national government. And the American system is potentially set up to enhance that possibility. And it goes both ways, both under a Trump presidency and under a Biden presidency. And that fault line is gonna get wider. It's, it's, it's how it goes. I mean, it's how it went in the 1860s, how it went in the 1930s, partisan society, partisan American society produces a fault line between the center and the states. And I can't see that diminishing. And then finally, there, there are just demographic forces at work here. America is a very unhealthy society. Um, it's not just unequal, it's unequal on basic measures of health, life expectancy. Um, you know, it's, it has rampant problems with obesity, with suicide, um, with drug addiction, um, again, very unequally distributed. It's almost certainly the case. I think there are lots of potential reasons why the pandemic has been such a challenge for uh, American politicians to deal with. Um, some of it's to do with partisanship, some of it's to do with federal state divisions, but some of it is to do with the underlying unhealthiness of America's population. And these are generational trends. You don't elect a new president and get a healthier society. Um, these things precede Trump and they will long outlast him. And these forces are fundamental uh, to American politics and turning around, turning around a society which almost uniquely in human history is seeing life expectancy falling in many places you know, on, on various measures of progress, the, the progress has gone into reverse. And so to finish, the, the point I really want to make is I've, I've tried to say almost nothing about Trump because I think the danger with this election is the obsession from the outside that it's all about Trump. If Trump wins, American democracy is in terminal crisis. If Trump loses, it doesn't matter who beats him, redemption is at hand. And I think both of those things are profoundly implausible. 
I think uh, the, the forces that will constrain Biden have also constrained Trump. I think he is, a, I think it's dangerous to have someone so erratic and unstable in charge of America's nuclear arsenal. You know, it's, it, there are frightening aspects to Trump's presidency, but he's been constrained too, constrained by states, constrained by Congress, constrained by polarization, constrained by partisan public opinion, as Biden would be. I don't think four more years of Trump spells the end of democracy, but I don't think four years of Biden spells its salvation unless you believe he does have that potential to be a transformative president. All of which means that I think 2020 is a pivotal year in human history, but I would be surprised if the American presidential election will be the reason that historians look back and say it changed in 2020. Thank you very much, David. We'll, we'll come back to many of those uh, many of those themes, particularly I think some of those long term themes, and and perhaps the question of about the rules of the game. I mean, that one of the one of the narratives about Trump is that he has either ignored the rules of the game or changed some of them, but he obviously hasn't changed the constitutional rules, as as, as you rightly uh, say. Come back to that, and uh, Hitoshi, over to you in Japan. Um, how do things look from Tokyo? Okay, thanks very much, uh, Bill. Uh, and thank you, uh, David, for your very analytical uh, statement. I cannot uh, be that analytical because I am a mere former diplomat. So I shall talk about two issues. Uh, one uh, question by Bill, why it matters to us, in particular to Japan. Probably it matters more for Japan than for the UK, because one of the crucial subject we will have to cope with in the coming years is a question of rising China. How to cope with China? The Japan is in a unique position, meaning that in order to cope with China in terms of strength, in terms of capability, we cannot be alone. We would have to be aligning ourselves to the United States we need a credible US in order to cope with uh, China into the future. It's not a short-term issue. It's a long-term issue. What China states, what China says, Xi Jinping says, chi China dream. And their target date is 2049, uh, when the, uh, they celebrate a hundredth, hundredth anniversary of establishment of the nation of China. And again, their sort of uh, objective is to get rid of the period of humiliation. Humiliation for China started from opium war, lost, uh, you know, UK. UK did win and China had to get rid of Hong Kong. That's the beginning of the uh, humiliation. And China lost the war with us, Japan-China war in 1895, and we got Taiwan. Therefore, Chinese dream is to get rid of this uh, long period of humiliation. And they started sort of developing their nationhood. And we had uh, 1989, the Tiananmen incident. And I am, I am saying that this is a war uh, not the actual war, but is the confrontation starting from 1989, Tiananmen incident up until 2049, 60 years. This is just the turning point, 2020. So for Japan, China uh, is a very, very, we sort of enjoy very strong interdependent relationship economically, and also in terms of visiting people to Japan. So we would like to maintain this large economic opportunity vis-a-vis -vis China, but at the same time, we do not want a hegemon on the part of China in the region. In order to cope with that, we need a very stable, credible America. I don't see it from Trump America. China says that we are in the center of international cooperation. Look at the United States, US is going away from multilateral cooperation. I do, don't, I do not consider that Trump will win uh, in the coming uh, election in 10 days. Biden will win. But yet the very basic 
sort of characteristics of Chinese relationship with the United States won't change. There is a fundamental issue here. United States cannot stand China under the communist rule to be a hegemonial power in the region. We cannot stand as well. Therefore, that is the reason why I say the state of affairs in the United States does indeed very, very significant for us. Therefore, we would like to see a stable America, credible America, reconstruction of credibility on the part of the United States in the, in the coming years. That point number one. Point number two, how should I see the state of affairs in the United States? What, what are the elements which are undermining US dem democracy? And very simply put, it's a divide. Divide in relation to income, income disparity, and also in terms of ethnic uh, divide in the United States. And it won't change over time. I mean, it is, if you look at this, uh, the, uh, uh, the population change, white, American white will not be a majority by 2045. And the road to the, uh, the sort of minority uh, state status of white America is starting long ago. And again, there is a deep, deep frustration in the United States to the fact that there are so many non-white Americans in the United States. At the same time, there is a deep, deep frustration regarding the income disparity, which is widening every day. So those, unless the new administration seriously address those two issues, the US democracy is going to deteriorate much further. And again, as David is right in saying that it's not a short term question of who is going to be the president of, of the United States. The Trump, if Trump becomes, Trump is reelected, the situation would get worse. But at the same time, the basic trend, divide, will continue even under uh, uh, the new president of, uh, so what I would like to say here is, again, this is a long-term tendency, unless we, they sort of address the question of debate, racial, and also the uh, income disparity, uh, the uh, state of affairs in the United States regarding their democracy is going to be deteriorated. So I, I should stop here, thanks. I need to unmute myself. Thank you very much, Hitoshi. Um, but that was very, very clear and very strong um, on what uh, what you need. I'm going to come back straight with a question to you, uh, because actually somebody just put a question in chat about policy towards China. Um, and I, I'm wondering if you, I, I think I, I would like to lob it to you as a question of really what consists of um, a strong policy of the United States towards China. The questioner asks, um, I'm worried that Biden is too biased and weak to stop China's intention to conquer the Pacific to become a hegemonic power, as you said. Uh, maybe the lesser of the two evils in, in terms of facing up to China, China could be Trump. Mm -hmm. Also, my immediate question for coming on to the structural issues is, how do you see the clarity and stability of, of policy towards China in recent administrations, including the Trump administration? Um, and and uh, the, the issues of continuity versus change. Hmm. I do think that uh, Biden administration will come back to the international cooperation, not necessarily only to do with multilateral cooperation regarding the uh, Paris Agreement or the uh, non-proliferation Iran agreements. I think even in relation to China, Biden will take an approach in which he calls for international alliance uh, regarding the precise policies toward China. And that is very needed because we are talking about China who has a very strong economic relations with rest of the world. Unless all the partners 
in the region, inclusive of UK and European Union, cooperate for the purpose of changing China concept. There is no, you know, safe period of time into the future. Trump, and again, the uh, there is a, a very strong unilateral measures on the part of Trump, like raising tariff, like uh, like up, uh, applying. Uh, uh, sanctions, uh, kind of one-sidedly, and uh, the Secretary of State says that no longer engagement policy. <laughs> I don't think there is such a thing like no non-engagement policy. While you enjoy the huge trade volumes from China, uh, go and out from China, therefore. I think the right policy to China is a mixture of strong pressure exerted on China uh, in relation, you know, by allying ourselves and engagement policy. There is a selective engagement we, we do need, like uh, trade uh, relationship investment, the rule making, environment, energy, and all sorts of things. But, important thing is you do it uh, same time, engagement policy and strong, stronger pressure, not just from the United States, but the rest of the world. That is the only solution in relation to the question. If not, we are going to lose China or, you know, there are, there are I mean, people say that this is a second Cold War. I disagree because one, there are too much sort of uh, interdependency vis-a-vis -vis China. Two, there is a possibility of actual war centering upon, for instance, Taiwan. During the time of Cold War, there was no possibility of real war, but in relation to China, there may be. So that sort of add uh, much sort of stronger case for you know, partial engagement alongside with stronger pressure. Oh, could I say something Thank very you. briefly? Yes, I have. David, yes, please, yes. Uh, because it's uh, the other thing that we do when we fixate on presidential elections is we forget there are congressional elections too. And US-China relations are very um, themselves baked into particularly politics in the Senate. And presidents, though they have a lot of discretion in international affairs, are also, and they have been throughout American history, constrained by Congress. And so it does matter a lot as well <clears throat> what happens to the Senate in this election for things, you know, it's not just about internal partisanship, for the possibility of uh, some positive reconstruction of US-China relationships. And there's a lot of um, strong opinion outside of the White House that would seek to constrain a Biden presidency, particularly if the Republicans keep hold of the Senate. And I think looking from the outside, we, we look too much at the White House as an autonomous actor in these things. Um, it's not the case. And it, you know, on election night, it really will matter who wins Montana as well as who wins the nation. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, I agree entirely with that. And I'll just add, to, I mean, on Itoshi's point as well, I would just observe on the, the way the Trump administration has, uh, has evolved. I mean, looking perhaps too fixately at the White House, they seem to me to have late in their period embrace some of the idea of multilateralism in the sense that they're trying to get Britain and Germany and others to, to go alongside with them rather belatedly on thing, issues like Huawei and technology um, in a way that uh, previously they were simply insulting us. Um, and so it is, it's the partly back to the erratic uh, point that David made, made about their, 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 their policies. Let me ask, um, for coming to some of the uh, excellent questions, David, a, a bit on the polarization and instability of uh, America um, and your observation of that. I mean, um, as an old Japan person, I remember some of these same arguments being made in the 1980s about America, about Reagan's America, about how hopelessly divided it was, about how sick it was, how, what a declining society it was, um, riven by ethnic um, divides and so forth. Um, is, is this, a, so what, how do you see this as it will separate the permanent American condition, which is, is in a way that it is always a bit like this, and the long-term trends? 
Yeah. It's a good question. I think we tend to see all of these things as either or. You know, it's either if America is not in on the ascendancy, it's in decline. And you know, on some, so America is a much less violent society than it was 20, 30, 40 years ago. Um, I mean, that, you know, statistically, on some measures, America is a much more equal society in terms of gender relations than it was. 30, it, in many ways, it's a more tolerant society around questions like gay marriage and so on. Uh, you know, remarkable changes going along with other forms of polarization, um, other trends, particularly, you know, I mentioned health, but not exclusively around health. I think educationally, America is a weaker society than it was 30 or 40 years ago. And there are other divides. So I absolutely agree with Hitoshi, but there are other divides too, and they're not unique to America. There is a deep generational divide in American politics. If you, if you just look at voting patterns, age is probably a greater determinant of how people are likely to vote in this election than income, for instance. Mm -hmm. And education is the other great divide. Um, with Trump famously said in 2016, I, I can't, I'm, I'm paraphrasing here, but he more or less said, I love the uneducated because they vote for me. Meaning, you know, he, he stands for people who didn't go to college. And 40 years ago, that divide didn't exist in the way it does now, not least because 40 years ago, not so many people went to college as they, they do now. A society where roughly half of young people go to college and half don't creates a whole new division. But then those divisions are not unique to the United States. You know, Brexit Britain has those divisions too. What it doesn't have is the, the absolutely central historic racial divide of American politics. Um, and I don't think it has the full extent of the kind of toxicity of the mistrust. I mean, I think British politics is pretty mistrustful at the moment this week, uh, but my sense from the outside is relative to the United States. The lack of any shared language to speak across that divide. You know, one of those uh, statistics that sometimes offered 40 years ago when people were asked whether Republican or Democrat, how would you feel if your daughter or son married someone from the other side? I think somewhere between five and 10% would have objected to it. Now it's between 40 and 50%. So that trend from Reagan's time to Trump's time is a huge shift. And that's where I think the institutional paralysis is so difficult because not only does the institutional paralysis entrench the divisions, but the divisions make it much harder to reform the institutions. And I don't think America is uniquely suffering from this, but I think America's institutional arrangements make it a particularly acute problem and you know, four years of a Biden presidency is not going to resolve that. Even if he wins big, it's not going to resolve that. A question to you both, that, um, both Hitoshi and David, that um, David Walter has put quite provocatively. Um, he says, have we all been a, in a collective denial of the fact that America was never really democratic, but a neo-Athenian state that had built its power on establishing a caste system, as he puts it? Um, I mean, I think this, this leads to the question of, well, are we overly fixated on as it were, the democratic processes rather than the stability and coherence of the, of the society and perhaps the effectiveness of, of the decision making? What is it? Mostly, that perhaps Hitoshi since, uh, next. I mean, I what is it that most people uh, worry about? Yeah, the heart of the matter. I mean, debates are there uh, in many countries, even in Japan as well. But yet, the question is all those frustrations, complaints, dissatisfactions are fairly represented at the political scene or not. The uh, 2016 election clearly demonstrated that people in the United States expressed a very severe dissatisfaction to the establishment. And as Bill put it in the opening remarks, the question is the fairness of political institutions. Are they the kind of representativeness? Is, is it being kept in various political institutions? What about the con US Congress? I mean, it's absurd to have such uh, unrepresented Senate, two from each state, while you have massive number of important economic entities in California, in Texas, and all sorts of things. Are we seeing this US Supreme Court representative? No way, six to three. And the 
other institutions such as big companies, bureaucracies, I mean, they do not reflect the changing fabrics of US community. That is a problem. And as David states, it is awfully difficult to change it. But yet, I think the heart, of, the heart of the matter is indeed the question of political institution. I mean, you cannot change all of a sudden the people's perceptions. You, at least you can try to change the political institutions. And David, do you, th I mean, uh, part of the question is whether uh, in America, we like to talk about America as the world's leading democracy, mm. but um, is, is our interpretation of that really that we think of it in the past as been, having been the most effective and successful country that happened to have a democracy? Mm. Words, are we really talking about the nature of its democracy? Are we talking about the nature of its decision-making and power in the past? And is it the disconnect between those two things that now matters in your yeah, I mean, I think it's true that no, no nation now seeking to build its democracy would take the American institutional arrangement as its model. Um, I mean, I think that, that hasn't been true for a long time. I think it's also true that, you know, it's true of America in many ways, it's all things. So it's simultaneously, in some respects, much more democratic than other democracies at the local level. You know, this is going back to, you know, it has deep democratic roots. It wasn't... Um, we don't, it's not a misnomer to call the United States a, a very democratic society, but it also has profoundly undemocratic elements and institutions deliberately set up that way. The Senate is one. The Electoral College is the other. I mean, you, you, Bill, you say 40 years ago, people were saying the same things about, you know, it's too divided, it's too this, it's too that. People have been trying to reform the Electoral College for about 200 years, I mean, certainly for 100 years. Um, and it turns out it's very difficult. It, you know, there's one obvious reason why it's difficult, which is that the winners have won under the electoral college system. So they're slightly less incentivized to reform it than the losers. And Biden, it'll be a very interesting test, I think, um, of a Biden presidency, the extent to which he wants to expend political cap capital on fights about institutional change when he will have so many other things on his plate, relations with China, dealing with the COVID pandemic, fundamental economic questions. And you know, the other reason that institutional change is so hard is in a four year cycle, how much of those four years do you want to spend, for instance, trying to reform the Senate when there are all the other things that you need to do that have a much more immediate political payoff? And you know, I think it would be naive to think, I've read articles saying that the way Biden will signal a fresh start for America is the first thing he needs to do is institutional reform. I would be surprised if Biden's chief of staff on day one sits him down and says, Joe, number one, let's tackle the Senate. Uh, so it's, you know, it's, it's a huge challenge. But in the same way, I think we think presidential elections are all or nothing. You know, it's either going to be the end of the world or it's going to be you know, the sun rising. I think America is both simultaneously more democratic and less democratic than other democracies. But at the moment, those forces are really pulling in different directions. That includes the point I made about central power versus federal uh, versus state and local power, federal versus the, the lower levels. Uh, when an American democracy works well, there's a kind of back and forth between them. There isn't a, what there is now, just this gulf. And I mean, I think that's gonna be a huge challenge. Dynamic things are happening in American democracy at the state level but not in Washington. And do you just as a, as a quick supplement, um, you said earlier the interesting uh, uh, point that America's in many ways, on many measures, a less violent society than it was 20, mm. 30 years ago. Mm. Um, and indeed, uh, the sort of recent riots and so forth uh, the, um, and protests are, are nothing compared with the, uh, sort of the 1960s and early 1970s. Mm. Um, people talk about you know, a new civil war um, and you know, violence after the election. What, what's your take on that and your, your judgment? So, so trends are just trends and they can always go into reverse. And some of the trends about declining violence have gone into reverse over the last four years, including in some of the big cities, no question. 
and America, you know, we haven't mentioned it, but among other things, what makes America different from every other major democracy in the world is that the number of guns in private hands makes it a completely different, uh, you know, it's, it's a completely different enterprise, political conflict. Um, there's a line in my book that you mentioned, How Democracy Ends, where I say, it's worth thinking, it's not hard to imagine people who are willing to kill for Donald Trump, but for a civil war, there have to be lots of people who are willing to die for him as well. And I'm not sure I think if you put it as bluntly as that, uh, America is still a peaceful, prosperous, stable society relative to America itself. So I, that book was partly arguing the 1930s are not our point of comparison here. There is no comparison between 2020 America and 1920 America on almost every measure which leads to political instability. I'm not trying to sound complacent. I think there could be some very unpleasant consequences, particularly of a contested election result. But civil war, I've always been a little doubtful that 21st century America is going to do that again. Hmm. Hitoshi, um, do you, first of all, do you agree with that assessment about the, the likelihood of violence or at least the, the sense of, of, of the violence of the society? But second, um, a question has come in from Thomas Coleman asking, is it time we stopped looking to America for international leadership and started looking elsewhere? Um, about their unreliable and inconsistent foreign policy, would it not be better to look towards regional powers for leadership instead? So combine those two questions. Um, is America too, if it is so un too unstable to rely upon, is there an alternative beyond Chinese hegemony? I would rather try to change America because yes. we clearly understand that there is no uh, such capable nation in terms of economic ability and also military capability as well. Therefore, I think I uh, cannot be too naive about the uh, possible alternative to America, but yet uh, all those, uh, I mean, what I don't understand here is uh, you see declining democratic force in the United States and I see in particular declining intellectual capability in the United States. All those intelligent people stopped talking about democracy uh, I mean, in the real way. <laughs> there are people who may complain. And again, one of the crucial timing for all this process would be after November 3rd up until January 20th next year, the process in which the, uh, the president is going to be finalized. The you know, new pre president will be finalized. And this is going to be a very, very severe battle between Trump and Biden. I mean, the whole question, we look at those situation and we would like to see common sense prevail, whether or not that common sense supported by uh, intelligence would come about. That going to determine the future American leadership in the world. And as I said, <laughs> I think there is a desirability for us like Japan, UK, Europe and others to cooperate with each other, but not for the purpose of beating the world, but for the purpose of improving the United States. That is a very, very important task for Japan as well, because Prime Minister Abe is known for his very intimate relationship with Trump. And I don't believe he was able to change the policies on the part of Trump. But yet, when we, you know, join our efforts, we meaning the, the uh, advanced democracies. You know, there may be a way for us to change America. Can I just say something briefly but on that point about, yeah. Yeah. It, it, it is absolutely crucial what happens between November and January. I think everyone is aware that that's potentially a very destabilizing period, not just for America, but for the world. But there are, you know, it's not just about what, um, Trump and Biden decide there are two key people here, Mitch McConnell and John Roberts, the Republican leader of the Senate. And then the, he's not a Republican, but uh, um, the, 
uh, Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. And it's not at all clear that either of those two men would want to give Trump four more years in the White House on the basis of a contested election. It's at least possible that each of them might calculate that uh, their interests and Republican interests and the institutions they represent, their interests are best served by having Biden in the White House and actually you know, holding on to what authority that they have in their respective places of power. And I don't think it's by any means a foregone conclusion that once it gets really difficult and contested after November the 3rd, that the Republican Party stands behind Trump. I don't think that's at all for sure. In the same way, I, you know, people who kill for Trump but won't die for him, that applies more metaphorically to people's careers and interests and legacies. And I'm not sure either John Roberts or Mitch McConnell are willing to mm -hmm. sacrifice their legacy for Donald Trump. They will fight for him when he's there. But I would be wary of thinking that it's just going to be both sides digging in after a contested result. And which, just to add on that, I mean, that's at risk of asking you to micromanage the result. I mean, what, what outcome in the co in Congress would, would favour or disfavour that judgment of yours? Yeah, so there's, I, I, I actually can't do this. I think it's too, too complicated. The sort of, you know, is, is there a way in which the Democrats regain the Senate, but Trump still holds on to the White House because assuming the trends are broadly... Um, it, 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 it's very hard to say, but there is, I mean, we, we took the podcast you mentioned I host, we talked about this a couple of weeks as a really interesting scenario, which is the assumption that a Supreme Court with Amy Barrett on it gives Trump the presidency in a contested election. There are strong incentives for that Supreme Court to side with Biden in order to establish its bona fides as a semi-independent institution so that over the next four years, it can then do what it wants to do, which is a conservative mm -hmm. agenda, which is not Trump's agenda. Um, it's, it's the Republican Federalist Society conservative agenda. So there's all sorts of kind of games and sort of almost inside baseball calculations that are gonna happen between November and January if it's closed. None of which seem to me are likely to lead to civil war. Right. Yeah. No. I. I. I could absolutely um, agree with that. Let's talk a little bit. Nicholas McLean has asked about um, Kamala Harris and uh, what impact she will she is having. Um, and as it comes to your point, David, we shouldn't get um, overly uh, um, excited about uh, the, the sort of minutiae of the of the presidential race. But um, as she's also from California. Um, uh, what impact do you if and if will she help Biden win? But uh, but secondly, um, if if she were to become president, is that does that then start to lead um, the White House in a different direction? Do you think? Um, so I don't, I don't think I mean vice presidents on the whole don't make much difference, and certainly she's not going to deliver California for Biden because California was already Biden's. He could have he could have nominated you know, Sarah Palin, and California would still. Um, so I don't think it makes a difference to the outcome, but it goes back to that point I made at the beginning, which is there is this tendency to think that Biden is a bridge to somewhere else, that his presidency is not meaningful in its own right. He exists to get Trump out of the White House. And then the Democratic Party's various factions try to leverage the person they want to succeed him. There's a thought that he might not last four years, there's questions about his health and so on. Um, Kamala Harris was, was a, you know, she was briefly the front runner to be the nominee. And in the end, she turned out to be a rather a weak candidate and quite easily taken down by her rivals. Um, and it's not clear to me that she would necessarily be, uh, you know, a particularly strongly placed person to unite the Democratic Party if she succeeded to the presidency. So I think she's, um, she's a, it's a bit like Biden. She's sort of there because the, the mission is to get Trump out of the White House. The question about what it would mean longer term, I think it's still wide open. And, and one last point, we should remember that we talked about divisions in the Republican Party, the Democratic Party is hugely divided on big questions of particularly culture and identity, but also policy, um, Green New Deal, the environment. You know, Biden is talking softly, softly about fracking. Some people in his party think that's his greatest sin. Um, it's not going to be easy. It wouldn't be any easier for Kamala Harris than Joe Biden to bridge those divides, I think. Um, but I think Biden might be the more experienced politician. So mm -hmm. you might have a better shot at it. 
You're, you're muted. Foolish. Uh, Hitoshi, there's a question um, from Becky Kendall about um, Russia. What role do you think Russia is playing and will play first on the West relationship with China? But also, do you think that uh, Russia is consciously acting in terms of change, trying to change the way democracy works or doesn't in various countries, including the United States? I think I think she means. Um, how do you see China, for, uh, Russia, and its role from Tokyo? Well. <laughs> I mean, I remember the time when we uh, we were so happy about uh, changing uh, Soviet Union and changing Russia in the early 1990s. And we were so, uh, I mean, Japan was quite reluctant to include Russia into G7 to make it G8 because, you know, the, the prevailing argument is that by including Russia, we shall not sort of uh, take back the Russian democracy by sort of getting Russia in the uh, Democratic League, Russia would have to be like us. But it turned out that Russia is not. Russia is much more original sentiment of big power mentality. Therefore, Russia will move to pursue this. And I mean, Russia today doesn't have that capability, military capability, econ in particular, they don't have any significant economic capability, but they find China as a convenient partner in Russia's quest for living with the United States. Therefore, combination of Russia, China would be very bothersome for us. We would very much like to see much more, you know, softer China. <laughs> softer Russia may not be a possibility. <laughs> Therefore, better to deal with China first. Russia is no longer the significant entity to change the course of the world, but China may be. David, uh, thank you, Hitoshi. David, um... Chika Tonooka has asked, going back to your The Confidence Trap, which is obviously read, talks about how you talked about American anxieties about the rise of Japan in the 1980s mm -hmm. and the widespread anticipation then that 21st century belonged to them. And she's asking, how do you view the current West or US China tensions? Do you see it in the same, something of the same way as you concluded uh, about uh, US Japan phobias? Or do you think it's different this time and that the issues are essentially internal to the US, I guess? Um, so th there, was, there, there was a sort of bubble of um, particularly US anxiety about Japan in the 1980s. And Bill, you were one of the people who punctured it a bit. Um, uh, and there's a slight bubble element, I think, to this too, that you know, these things go in trends or fashions. And, there's a, and, and this goes back to that point that this isn't just about what happens in the White House, um, the American, the American political class is in a, a bit of a panic about China. Um, I think it's obviously different. You know, the history doesn't repeat itself and that the, the long-term trends towards China's growth and expansion are pretty clear, I think, in the way that Japan in the 1980s, there was a genuine bubble element around it, including not least the Japanese stock exchange and real estate prices. Um, I don't think the two are comparable, but. I think the way it plays out, and this is through, through through the history of the American Republic, anxiety about rising powers, anxiety about you know, who are going to be our rivals, as it passes through American democracy, tends to often comes out as paranoia. It often revolves around conspiracy theories. You know, famously, the paranoid style in American politics is two hundred years old. I mean, it starts with the founding of the republic. I mean, it starts with the Declaration of Independence. Um, which is a kind of conspiracy theory about the, the British king. Um, and so, so there's a persistent theme there, I think, that sort of cool-headed, rational appraisal of long-term trends and risks is not what you're going to get from American democratic politics on these questions. But I don't think, you sh I don't think we should think that uh, you know, the thought that the 21st century might be the Japanese century as viewed from the 1980s is comparable to the thought that the 21st century will partly be the Chinese century as viewed 
from the 2020s. The second seems to me a much more durable view, but the, the panic around it is recognizably the same, I think, the anxiety, the, the paranoia, and the some question, of the racism too, it should be added. Absolutely. I think the other qu the question related to that then is um, whether you know, in Japan there's a there's a word um, gaiatsu, the use of foreign pressure to uh, produce domestic change, um, and the question is whether this paranoid style in American politics is used in a constructive way and were to to uh, implement domestic transformations of major or lesser extent, either in response to genuinely a, a, an external threat or simply as a as an excuse or whether um, they are simply destructive and xenophobic distractions. Uh, and I wonder what you, how you see it as having been unfolding in the last, well, it's more than four years, really, that this obsession has been there about China, but particularly the last four years. Is it a, is it a distraction technique of, of uh, in Trump and in Congress, or is it uh, actually a genuine attempt to reform domestically in response? Or is there such an attempt? The question to me, I think, I think that the the evidence of American history is that um, it's not usually a measured and constructive form of politics. Um, that 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 way of doing politics is not well suited, I think, to the American political system. It doesn't mean that America doesn't do it a lot, but um, uh, it, th th this is not America's strength. The, the ability to apply pressure in constructive ways. I think um, um, the history of the American Republic is of lurching backwards and forwards, not least lurching from engagement to disengagement and back again in very often very rapid political cycles. I don't think anyone should look at the United States and look for long term constructive versions of that form of politics. I think that would be asking too much, even under a Biden presidency, but certainly not under a Trump one. And Hitoshi, um, I, we, as we start to run out of time, but my own question on the hypothesis of a, of, you say, of a Biden in the White House and perhaps of a change of control of, of, of Congress, how, if at all, would um, Japanese government's policy change? Uh, would the... Yeah. Before I uh, respond to this question, I'd like to add some words in relation to the comparison between China and, and Japan. Uh, yes, please. The uh, United States had an anxiety uh, of Japan being ascending. Uh, at that time, late 80s, beginning of 90s, Japanese D GDP was about 60% of United States. But today's China, after this corona pandemics, China represents about 75% of the US GDP. And the question the anxiety the United States has may not be anxiety uh, in relation to the country who is ascending, but anxiety for the country like China overpassing the United States, which is very, very sort of, you know, significant issue for the US. That's point number one. Point number two, United States absolutely has been controlling Japanese military under the US-Japan Security Treaty. Therefore, United States has had the confidence that Japan will not a uh, military power. Therefore, their anxiety, their sort of uh, intention was much more commercial than anything else in Japan. This Gaiatsu thing, Japan thought that opening up the market is important for itself. As uh, you said, that uh, the Gaiatsu is convenient to force because it doesn't employ domestic political strength. It is coming outside. Therefore, it's easier for the government to, uh, to uh, open up the market. Therefore, but China is not. China sees things, this, uh, the country in terms of power. And also there is a very strong nationalism against the foreign power. Therefore, this is entirely different case, I should imagine. The question you pose to me is the Biden administration will have impact on Japanese policy. Uh, yes, indeed, uh, the, the American policy change will have immediate impact on us as well. I do think that the United States, democratic government of the United States, Biden administration will 
uh, will be much more using pressure on what we call burden sharing issue. The Trump was talking about the uh, increased burden sharing on the part of Europe in relation to military budget. And I'm sure Biden administration would do the same. Japan is currently negotiating uh, in relation to the sharing cost of US military station in Japan. And that's going to be a difficult process. Uh, but as far as other part of the uh, American policy is concerned, as I said, administration, the Biden administration will place more importance on international cooperation. And that is welcome by Japan as well. Well, I think it would be welcome by Britain too, although it's unclear quite what Britain's own foreign policy is at the moment, but uh, then we have other distractions, perhaps one might say. Um, we've come to the end of our time. I want to thank um, both uh, Hitoshi Tanaka and David Runciman very warmly for joining us today and for giving us such a clear uh, and analytical um, view of what's going on in the United States and its importance. Uh, the debate tonight will be theatrics, um, but the real ev event um, is uh, next Tuesday, is Tuesday week, um, November the 3rd. And personally, I'm count counting the minutes until we get there. I can't wait till the whole thing's over. But uh, nevertheless, that's perhaps because I like to uh, see the result and analyze the result rather than um, all the uh, theatrics on the way up. But it's very, very important to us both. And I thank you both for explaining so clearly what the long-term trends are, as well as what's at stake for us. Thank you to, the, uh, to our Japan Society members for joining us and for people in Japan as well. I can see on the list have joined. Um, and I wish you a good evening, Hitoshi, and a good day, David. Thank you very much again. Thank you, thank you very much. Thanks very much. Thank you.